Alright guys, so today I want to turn my attention away from my new shop for a little bit and focus here in my garage at our house. So as you guys might remember, I built this very big garage workbench and miter saw station combo about three years ago now, which is kind of crazy. And overall, it's been great. It was really useful when I was building the tiny house. Now I'm not doing as much work here at the house and really it's just too big for our garage. This is a full four by eight workbench top and this is only a 21 by 21 garage. So if there's any hope of ever getting a car in here again, I need to change things up. And so let me show you what I've been working on. So here is the new setup. So instead of this large workbench, I'm gonna have this miter saw station and kind of workbench combo, which is built in, tucked away here against the wall. Because I'm not gonna use a traditional fence system on the miter saw station, I can use each side of this as kind of a small workbench. Overall, I think this is gonna be a great option and should really help declutter our garage. So I started my build by breaking down my material at my miter saw and I went really simple with this project and used all two by fours for the base. And my main goal was to build the entire miter saw station without having to buy any new materials because I have a bunch of materials left over from moving out of my old shop, lots of two by fours. I've got random sheets of plywood hanging around and I just wanted to make some use out of that material that I've just been storing away at the new shop. After cutting all my parts to size, I could start assembling the bases. And each half of these bases is made up of these two frames, which make up the top and then the bottom shelf. And these frames are basically built like small two by four walls. I made sure to clamp my pieces together to keep them from shifting around during assembly. And I used three inch screws to attach all the pieces. And I also made sure to pre-drill and countersink the holes to avoid splitting these two by fours. Also, I should mention that I could have definitely used pocket screws here to hide some of these screw holes, but to be honest, I just didn't care that much. I think two by four workbenches are pretty basic looking anyway, so I figured why go through all the extra hassle, and I was really more going for speed here. I assembled the second frame in the same way, and I should also mention that I do have plans available for this miter saw station in case you guys are interested in building something like this. And the plans include a cut list, a cutting diagram, and step-by-step -step instructions. And I can also include a SketchUp file if you're interested. And I'll link to the plans in the video description below. Once the top and bottom frames were assembled, I could go ahead and attach the legs. And I did use a little glue here just to kind of help strengthen everything. And once again, I just used those three inch screws to assemble everything. And I did go ahead and check the legs to make sure they were square to the frames before adding all of the screws. Once all four legs were added, I added some spacers to set the bottom shelf location and then attached the bottom shelf in the same way with more screws. Once that was done, the left half of the miter saw station frame was built so I could repeat the whole process for the right half as well as the miter saw platform. Next, I could go ahead and attach all three sections together and I did this upside down on my workbench. I added some pieces of scrap as spacers to lower the saw platform to the correct height and then just attached the platform to the bases with more screws. And I probably went a little overboard with the screws on this project, but I definitely want things to be secure and I want this miter saw station to last a long time. I attached the left section in the same way as the right section and I realized that assembling this whole thing on top of a four by eight workbench is a little bit of a luxury and definitely simplified things, but I could have done this on my garage floor as well if I didn't have this larger workbench. Once everything was assembled, I could lower the base off of the workbench, which was definitely easier said than done by myself. Nice. And then I could move it into place. And I needed to figure out where exactly it would be installed here in the garage. And I decided to just basically center the entire thing on this wall. Before installing the miter saw station, I had to figure out how to work around this concrete block that goes around the entire perimeter of this garage floor, as well as how to account for the pretty significant slope on the floor, which is almost two inches over this 10 foot width. I started my installation by marking the stud locations and then installed a ledger board along the wall at the height where I wanted the frame to be. And I used a laser level for this to make sure everything was nice and level and straight. Once the ledger board was installed, I got the frame leveled, again, using the laser level for reference. And I used some of these broad fix shims I saw on my buddy Michael Alm's channel to help with this. And it was pretty simple to get everything dialed in since these shims come in a bunch of different thicknesses. Once the base was leveled, I could go ahead and install the plywood top. And I had already ripped the plywood to width at my shop since again, this was a piece of plywood I already had on hand. And next I could cut the pieces to length using my track saw. 
and I made all of my panels 27 and a half inches deep, which allowed the base of the miter saw station to clear that concrete block. And I definitely could have made the top even deeper if I wanted a little bit more working space, but I just didn't want to take up more space here in the garage. I attached the plywood to the ledger board and then flushed the edges of the frame with the plywood, which brought everything into square and then added a bunch of screws to secure everything. While I'm working, let's take a second to talk about the sponsor of this week's video, Anchor and their 757 Powerhouse Power Station. So I've been using my 757 Powerhouse for about a year now, and it is an amazing resource to have on hand. I recently had a power outage at my shop right in the middle of wrapping up an edit, and thankfully I had my computer, monitor, and external hard drive all plugged into my 757 Powerhouse. So I never lost power and had plenty of battery capacity to wrap up the edit and transfer some files off of the computer. The Anchor 757 uses premium lithium iron phosphate batteries, which can be fully depleted and recharged over 3,000 times with the batteries still in a healthy state. And this is great as it means I can use my power station for years to come worry-free. Also, Anchor's powerhouse power stations are backed by a five-year warranty for peace of mind. The 757 has a capacity of 1,229 watt hours and a 1,500 watt output power, meaning it can power small appliances like mini fridges, coffee makers, microwaves, and more. And this makes the 757 great for car camping, RVing, portable job site power, or keeping things charged when the power goes out. The 757 can be recharged from 0% to 80% in just an hour, so it'll be ready for your next adventure in no time. The 757 features 13 ports in total, including six AC outlets, four USB-A ports, two USB-C ports, and a car socket, so you'll be able to power almost any device with your powerhouse. So power up with Anchor this summer by purchasing an Anchor 757 powerhouse of your own, and for a limited time, you'll get a discount and free gift with your purchase. Click the link in the video description below to learn more. And if I wanted to keep things super simple, I could have definitely stopped right there, but of course, I decided to make things a little bit fancier, and next, I went ahead and added some trim around the edges of the plywood, and this will both help to make things look nicer, but the trim will also help to keep the plywood edges from getting beat up over time. This trim was just a pine one by four ripped in half, and I just attached it with brad nails and glue. Once the trim was installed, I broke the edges with a block plane, and I really hate sharp edges on work surfaces like this because it seems like you're always bumping into them, so I'm a big fan of breaking all these edges, and there's something so satisfying about using a block plane. Next, I could go ahead and route the groove for my Rockler T-Track, and this is what I'll use for my stop lock system here on the Microsoft Station, but the T-Track will also offer some nice work holding options when I'm using these as a workbench. I set the bit depth on my router using a piece of T-Track for reference, and then added about a sixteenth of an inch to make sure the T-Track ended up below the surface of the plywood. Next, I set the edge guide so the T-Track would end up about six inches in from the front edge, and then I routed the groove in multiple passes since I used a half inch bit. Also, one pro tip here, go ahead and route both of your grooves if you're doing this on two sections like I am here, before changing your edge guide settings so you don't have to repeat the whole process multiple times. And I probably didn't really need T-Track on the right half of this miter saw station. I almost never use a stop block on that side of my miter saw station at the shop. But again, these are basically two little workbenches, so I think that T-Track will be useful for work holding. I finished up the routing and the T-Track groove turned out pretty much perfect. And next I needed to route another groove for the Rockler peel and stick measuring tape that I'm using with my stop block. And I used this simple stop block I built for reference on where I needed to route the groove. And this groove was only about a 16th of an inch deep and it's just to keep the tape from wearing out over time or edges of boards from catching on the edges of the tape. Once that was done, I could clear everything off of the miter saw station and get everything sanded to prep for finish. I made sure just to remove all of those pencil lines and smooth out the areas where that trim met up with the plywood. I also added some painter's tape to keep the polyurethane off my walls since I was going to be using a roller to apply the polyurethane. For my poly, I used my go-to shop finish Total Boat Halcyon Clear. I love this stuff. It's super durable. It dries really quickly in about an hour. And this gloss version is nice and slick and it makes for easy sliding of boards across the work surface. And it'll just help this surface from getting stained and marked up over time. I can just wipe it down and clean it up super easily. 
While the Halcyon dried, I went ahead and removed the cabinets from my big garage workbench and installed them here on the Microsoft station. And I'll include a cut list and step-by-step -step instructions for building these cabinets in the plans. And I basically designed this whole Microsoft station to fit these drawers. They're awesome. I love having big banks of drawers like this for storage in a garage shop environment. Since I made the openings in the bases a little oversized, I needed to add some shims before screwing the cabinets in place. And I cut off the shims with an oscillating tool and then got the drawers reinstalled. By that point, the first coat of Halcyon was dry, so I could go ahead and apply the second coat, and then I installed the other bank of drawers in the left half of the miter saw station. So now that the finish is dried, we can go ahead and get the T-Track and then the tape measure permanently installed and then set up the miter saw. And when installing this kind of T-Track in a single layer of plywood like this, this is a little more than three eighths inch thick. So by the time you route the groove, you do not have a lot of material left with the plywood. With a stop block like this, you're not gonna be putting a ton of force on this, but I like to just add a little bit extra insurance by adding something like a five minute epoxy or as Total Boat calls it, four minute epoxy. And that'll just help make that T-Track stay stuck to the plywood and relieve some of the stress that you'd be putting on the screws and in this case these are really really tiny screws because again I'm only going into about three-eighths of an inch of plywood here. I also like to use a self-centering drill bit when installing T-Track like this just to make sure it doesn't wander on me and then to cut this section to length I just use a miter saw. This T-Track is made of aluminum and regular woodworking tools your standard kind of saw blades will cut aluminum just fine. Just take it slow and it works out really nicely. So once the T-Track was installed, I could go ahead and get the miter saw set up on the miter saw station finally. And this was pretty straightforward. One thing I do when I'm setting up these kind of miter saw platforms on these kind of systems is I purposely set them about a quarter of an inch lower than they need to be. And that's because in my opinion, it's a lot easier to shim the saw up to exactly where you want it to be rather than trying to get the platform itself perfect. I know I've kind of overshot it and ended up with a too high saw a couple of times. Then you got to take the whole thing apart and redo it. One other thing I make sure to do when I'm setting the location of the saw on the platform is to set the miter angle to its maximum on both sides to make sure I have plenty of clearance and I'm not gonna run into the edges, which would obviously limit the functionality of the saw. One other thing I did forget to account for when setting this all up and shimming everything is that this saw has these little rubber feet. So when I went to screw it to the miter saw platform, the rubber feet compressed a little bit and that pulled it down below where I wanted it. So I added some more of those broad fix shims I mentioned earlier. I cut up one of the 1 32nd of an inch shims into a couple of pieces, put that under where the rubber feet were, reattached the screws and I was good to go. That said, if you're setting up a saw like this, you can definitely go ahead and just remove the rubber feet on most of these saws, but obviously I didn't want to take everything apart. So the next thing to do, and pretty much the last thing to do, is to set up the peel and stick measuring tape. And of course, I forgot to order the measuring tape for the left-hand side, because that side needs to measure from right to left, instead of the left to right measurement, like on this side. But I'll show you how I set it up on this side, and you'll get an idea of what it'll be like on the other side as well. So I built this simple little stop block when I was doing my miter saw station over at my shop a couple years back. Basically just a scrap piece of plywood. I routed a little groove in the bottom and then set in another scrap so that way the stop block won't twist around in the T-Track. And then I cut away the area where the T-Track bolt itself needed to go and it works great, super simple. But one nice thing about this particular Rockler T-Track, they call it a universal T-Track, and that's because it works with these kind of standard T-Track bolts. It also works with, I think it's 3 8 inch hex head bolts. That's why I like it, because pretty much any manufacturer's T-Track accessories will fit with this. So then to set the location of my peel and stick tape, I have this little indicator here that will basically read the tape. That also came from Rockler. Now I move the stop block to its furthest in position, as close to the blade as possible, because obviously I want to be able to cut as small a pieces as I can still with the stop block and take a measurement from from the edge of the blade to the edge of the stop block, and then I can peel and stick it into place. After attaching the tape, I went ahead and trimmed it flush with the ends of the miter saw station. And then finally, once everything was attached to the miter saw station, I could test out the stop block for accuracy. And thankfully it was dead on. And if I ever need to adjust things in the future, I can either cut the stop block itself shorter, or I can just move my little indicator, drill some new holes, and it's super, super simple. 
And with that, I think I can call this Microsoft Station a wrap. Again, I do have plans available. I'll link to those in the video description below. That being said, I definitely am not done here in the garage yet. I need to work on the rest of the decluttering process. Uh, I'm a little ashamed to show you guys what the garage looked like before, but I think it's gonna look great after. So if you guys don't wanna miss that video and all my future videos, go ahead and get subscribed and ring the notification bell so you don't miss my future videos. Also, I'll have links to all the tools and materials I use down in the video description below as always. And last, if you wanna support me, you can buy plans, you can buy my merch, or you can support me on Patreon or as a YouTube member. I'll link to both of those in the video description below. All right, thanks for watching y'all and until next week, happy building.